Good morning, church. Pastor Bradley, and if you, yeah, if you've been around the church for a little while now, you'll know that, yeah, my throat sounding funny is nothing unusual. It normally happens every couple of months. Get a little bit of a throat infection. So yeah, we'll do our best to get through today's message. But really excited today as we enter December, as we're looking to. Um, you know, the Christmas season, the festive season, looking to Jesus, the reason behind the season um, to celebrate Him. We, we believe He wants to bring us freedom, right? That's the, just in praying for us as a church and looking at next year, really believe the word He's given us is freedom, right? Freedom from stuff, freedom from past hurts, freedom just in Christ and Christ alone. So really excited even to be starting the, the end of the year um, or finishing the end of the year off with this, this uh, Christmas series called Travel Light and it's a uh, series that Life Church released years ago, and I've always wanted to do it and rework it as our own, but it's never really fitted with where we're at. And now it just seems that the Lord has gone before us and aligned everything so perfectly for us that we would be able to walk in freedom, walk in what He has for us. Um, yeah, from physical clutter to emotional baggage to past hurts and pains to future hopes, Jesus has something great for us, church. I, I believe it. I fully believe that the best is yet to come. I've been saying that the last couple of weeks, but I truly believe in faith that the best is yet to come for us as a church, for us as a community, for marriages, for work, for finances. The best is yet to come. That God is faithful, God is good, and He will meet us where we're at this morning, in our pain, in our hurt, but that we must fix our eyes on Him, the author and perfecter of our faith is going to carry us forward. And this time of year, we tend to overspend on stuff we don't need, right, to get to um, buy stuff, accumulate stuff, collect stuff we don't actually need. And it just weighs us down because it puts financial stress on or financial burden and relational strains, right? We're reminded of past hurts. Maybe you have a family gathering coming up and you haven't actually spoken to some of those family members or cousins for a while and it brings up hurts. Maybe there's family you can't meet with this year, right? A year of first, year of first Christmas, whatever it is. And that also brings with it emotional pain, emotional hurt. And, and this morning, I, I believe God wants to draw near to us. He wants to meet us in our pain, in um, exactly where we find ourselves, and, and just to hold us and encourage us and lift us up so that we would find freedom in Christ. <coughs> um, Right, and, and as I've said, the series we're going to be unpacking is freedom from stuff, freedom from pain, freedom from past hurts, freedom, freedom from future worry, and freedom in Christ alone. That we, we, what we'll see today, that the Bible has a lot to say about it, is freedom is found in Christ and Christ alone. And so often we try to find it in possessions or activities or people, and, and the world is not created to sustain us in that, right? And over the, the next few, few weeks, we're going to be talking about that, unpacking, looking, challenging us in how we proceed our possessions, how we perceive our past hurts, how we perceive so much of what's going on around us that we would find freedom in Christ. Um, and today we're going to speak about letting go of stuff, right? Because our houses are filled with stuff we don't need. It's collecting dust that's not good for us. It gives us throat infection. Um, we, we just accumulate as we go through lives, whether from our back, maybe from your, your upbringing, you didn't have lots and now it's almost as a form of security or that's where you identify, look how much I've worked, look how far I've made it or we sentimental onto our stuff so we're holding it on for maybe our children one day or we've got birthday cards from when we were four years old, I don't know what it is, but it's just accumulating in our stuff so we need bigger bonds, we need bigger things just to store all these earthly treasures up but the Bible's quite clear that thieves break in and moths and, and the rust destroy. And we're finding identity and security in those things where God's calling us to walk in freedom of those things, to remember the great joys of those activities, but not to be limited or tied down by them, which we'll unpack, right? So, so yeah, we keep stuff or we keep stuff in case one day I need it, right? So I know yeah, I'm bad with some of this stuff when it comes to tools or, or random nuts and bolts, right? We collect and we just have a bucket of bolts, which we're actually never going to use because none of them actually fit. And when we do need them, we just go buy a new one because it's a lot easier than spending three hours digging through a bucket for what we need. But we collect and then we get another bucket and another bucket and we just start collecting all these things that actually land up being in the way, being an obstacle and distracting us from, from just doing what God has called us to do. Um, so yeah, you know, we keep it. Um, and, and what if? And, and I had this idea. Just in, what if everything God has given us is actually an answer to someone else's prayer? What if the excess we have laying around could be a blessing to so many other people in this world? 
right? Perhaps our excess is an answer to someone else's prayer. Again, not saying there's anything wrong with stuff, not saying there's anything wrong with planning for the future, not saying there's anything wrong with keeping stuff. But if that's where our position or our position and identity and our purpose is found and, and we get so caught up and overwhelmed by the stuff around us in our houses, financially burdened by the things in our houses, surely it's time to walk in the freedom God has for us. Surely it's time to simplify our lives and go, okay, God, what is it that you want for me? What is it that you've called me to? <coughs> and we only and the truth that C.S. Lewis writes about it a lot, but he says we only true we only truly own things when we're willing to give it away, to bless others with it, to release it, right? That that um so often we are held captive by the things that are surrounding us in our homes. Not always the case, but but for a lot of us, if we're honest. We're we're, we're captive, it overwhelms us, it drains us, it it um burdens us. And Jesus doesn't want that for us this morning. We, uh, um, it's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does matter. Less of what doesn't matter, stuff, and more of what does matter, relationship, Jesus, the goodness of God. Right, more of Jesus, and, and stuff just gets in the way of that, as we'll see this morning. And the issue is our culture screams a different story, doesn't it? Our culture seems, screams, just get, 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 pay later, just, you deserve it, just fill your homes and your lifestyle so much stuff that distracts us from the emptiness that we need Christ. Right, right from the creation story, Adam and Eve, Satan came and got them to question the goodness of God, the satisfaction found in God, that God is enough. Right? Did God really say? Satan causes us and continues to cause us to doubt the goodness of God, the sufficiency of God, the awesomeness of God. Right? He says that. And from the beginning, Jesus made them question the goodness of God. Can he be trusted? Can satisfaction be found in him? And Satan's tactics have not changed to this day. He makes us doubt that satisfaction and the goodness of God. We profess on a, on a Sunday the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God, but on, Sunday, on Monday our words betray us. Right? Did God really say, do not eat of that fruit? In other words, so many of us believe that what you don't have today is, you know, what you don't have today is why your joy is missing. Right? We believe that if we can just get something more, something different, something changed, whatever it is, that's where joy will be found. But that's the lie of the enemy from creation. Right? You have all these other blessings that God has given us, that there's air in our lungs, whatever it is, and we just miss it. We take it for granted. We allow what we don't have or don't do to define our day instead of the blessings we do have, right? I'm horrible with this. If I don't get to go on a group cycle or oversleep, whatever it is, I can sulk the whole day. I'll just be checking the Stravas where you can see who's been riding. And I'll be, I should have ridden. I should have ridden the whole day. And, and it's quite easy for me just to sulk and become like a, a crybaby instead of focusing, okay, well, very often when I don't get to cycle early or go on a big group ride, I get more time with the family. I get to do stuff with them. I get to have extra rest. All good things, but I miss the blessing of those things because I'm too fixated on what I didn't get, what I don't have, what I can't achieve. Right, and, and that rings true for so many of us. We're so fixated on things that we don't have, things that we desire, that we're missing out what God has given us today. Right, and so we're constantly seeking satisfaction in created things that are not designed to satisfy, right? It's like trying to fill up on lettuce. I know a lot of you love dieting, right? So you just eat lettuce the whole time. And it may fill you up, but you're never truly satisfied because our bodies are created to enjoy the fullness of creation in moderation for sure, but it's created for those things. Right, Solomon tells in Ecclesiastes about the fruitless, fruitless pursuit of stuff. Chasing off the satisfaction and security and stuff, the, the pointless endeavor that the world encourages, the, the Bible says it's pointless. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 6, better is a handful of quietness, a handful of contentment, a handful in the presence of God um, in relationship with God's people. There are two handfuls of toil and striving after the wind. Right? Are you a person with one hand of calmness of the peace of God, the fruit of the Spirit, or are you juggling a hundred million balls? Just turmoil, everything, especially this time of year, right? End of school functions or work functions, whatever it is, you're just like, ah. <coughs> it is one hand. 
content in the presence of God, the goodness of God, than two hands of turmoil. How much of our chaos in our lives is due to trying to keep up, keeping up with the Joneses, from overspending, from overcommitting, from living beyond your means. Right? The challenge is, why do you have what you have? Why do you have what you have? Why is your house filled with so much stuff? Why is your Christmas list so long? What are you really hoping for this Christmas? And Jesus speaks a lot about wealth, which we'll have lots of verses today. Luke 12, 31 to 21. Right, and the, the brothers are fighting over the inheritance. They want to split it up. Verse 13, And someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things? Then he said, Beware, God against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. So he's saying there is a measure to life. Jesus is there. He's saying there's a measure to which we can evaluate our lives. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm with, which produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Nice problem to have. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yet a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. See, the measure of our lives is, not, is, is finding connection with God and not with stuff. See, he's not saying it's bad to store up treasures, but if that's where identity, our security, our rest comes from, from what we have in the bank and not from the presence of God, we've missed Jesus. We've missed the freedom in Jesus. Jesus is telling the two brothers and us today, you are not what you have. Some of you need to just repeat after me. You are not what you have. I am not what I have. I'm not defined by what I drive, by what I wear, by what I own, your, your, your stuff. Um, you have your stuff. It does not have you. And the lie is that you don't have all you need to be happy, fulfilled, cool, um, whatever it is, right? And yes, the, the big challenge today, which I think is, is, is a big challenge. What if the stuff you have is actually robbing you from the life you want? What if the stuff you have is robbing you from the life you want? Right, we want to work less, we want to be around more, we want it, but we also want a new car, a bigger house, more stuff, more security, all of those things, right? Ecclesiastes, better is one handful of tranquility than two handfuls of chaos, anxiety, of overexpended ourselves. And here's the thing, right? We don't just wake up. You don't hear a message like today or get a few Bible verses and wake up other than the supernatural work of, of the Holy Spirit, which is possible. But you don't just wake up all of a sudden being content with where you find yourself. You don't wake up all of a sudden being content with what you own and where you, you find yourself, right? It's a continual battle, a continual fixing your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith, continuing fixing your eyes on community and service and helping and, and others, that makes us content with where we find ourselves. Church, there's no easy solution, but what we fix our eyes on daily will either feed our contentment in Christ or feed our discontentment with what we have. Keep your eyes on Jesus and not your neighbors. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not your neighbors. Another verse which has nothing to do with this, but it says, you know, look at the log in your own eye rather than the stick in your friend's eyes. Totally out of context, so um, you can email me complaints on that one. But just look to God, look to yourself, do not look to others to find satisfaction or meaning or identity. Right, and there's a few things that can maybe help you towards your journey this morning. Practical practices for peace. Practical pa practices for peace. And I was tongue twisted to say three times fast. First thing to do this morning, church, is throw out. Just get rid of stuff, stuff that you don't need, stuff that's around you or sell it, but just get rid of it. We have a general rule in our house that if it doesn't get used in 12 months, you get rid of it. Right? Or if you don't, even every six months, we've had, are we using this? Does it serve a purpose? What is it for? Like, can we give it away? Can we sell it? Can, can we throw it away? What? Just give. 
so we're not bombarded by stuff. I mean, I remember, and we only got rid of it this, this year or sorted it out. We had a box sitting in our shed um, for five years. We, we rented our house out about five years ago on Airbnb, and we went away for December. So it took all the stuff, chucked it in a box. Only now that we moved again four months ago did I actually open that box. Right, for five years, it was just always in the way. Whenever I went into the shed, I had to move it or whatever it is, right? And, and more because of laziness, didn't deal with it because we were moving and gave great opportunity. But we have so much stuff to just throw away. <coughs> Stuff that is obsolete, stuff that you'll never use, stuff that maybe you keep it for your kids. I don't know, but your kids don't want it. And we've just collected and, and accumulated and, and filled our lives with dust and dirt and chaos instead of being a blessing with what it is that God has given us in excess of. Well, that's why I love what Craig Grishel says. He says, owning less is way better than organizing more. Owning less is way better than organizing more. I know there's that lady on Netflix. I, I never watched her show, but that, that, that um, so I can't remember. I don't even know her name, but so, so all about organizing. You go into the shops today, and there's all these nice glass containers for organizing better, and, and neatness is great, right? God loves order, so I do believe we need organization wherever we can in our lives, but make no mistake, it's easier to organize less than it is to organize more. Right? And, and, and in the New Testament, there was a man known to be a rich, young ruler. Right? He had lots of stuff. And the problem was with him is his stuff owned him. He didn't own his stuff. And we get that from the story. And this is the only person that Jesus speaks to in this way, kind of just, um, yeah, kind of this way, Let me, in order to follow Jesus. He wants to know, what must I do? Right? Luke 18, 22. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, there's still one thing you have, haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad for he was very rich. And we don't hear about him again, right? But we see he's, a, he's identified in scripture as a rich man. His life and purpose is found in his wealth and not as a man of God. Right? And, and listen to me. Here. Whatever defines us in life will always be an obstacle to your faith. Whatever defines you as a person in this life will be an obstacle to our faith. And they can be good things, right? It's defined as a family man, a wealthy man, a healthy man. Those are not bad in and of themselves. But we are not, if we are not defined as a people of God, a, 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 a man after God's own heart, a man that loves God, a man that is found in the Scripture, if we are not defined by those things, whatever it is that we do, no matter how noble and good they are, will always be obstacles in our faith. And we need to just come back to that we are found in Christ and Christ alone. And there's two reasons we don't get rid of stuff and I've touched on them, but let's just pin them for you. Number one is one is fear. We fear because of our upbringing, because of our surroundings or circumstances. We just hoard things because it is where we find security. Right, I've shared it before, right? I've shared many times, I, I have a strange thing. I find security in certain food items and it changes every couple of years, right? So I remember once I told you, tins of tomato, those, if those were in the cupboard, we were safe, there was food, no matter what. At the moment, it's currently breakfast cereal. I think we have, uh, no lies, about eight boxes of breakfast cereal, um, some from Black Friday, but as long as I, there's breakfast cereal, I know there's food in the house, right? It doesn't matter if, if there's nothing else in the house, we've got breakfast cereal. We, we somehow associate with certain possessions, we find security, we find comfort, right? Um, fortunately, with, with my children, those eight boxes won't last very long, so that's fine. Um, but the idea that we find security, we're so afraid of not having, we're so afraid of, of something else or, or trusting in God for faith or whatever it is, that we try to control circumstances, we try to control our possessions, right? And maybe it's how you grew up, maybe, I don't know what it is, but, but we have to come to a point where we let go and say, okay, God, you are in control. You have me, you, you will provide for me, you are in control. Right, but, but what if what God has given you now is to be a blessing to someone else? What if your ex is, maybe my eight boxes of cereal, maybe I've got to give them away. Me and the Lord will wrestle through that one. Because, well, that's my security. That's what I bought, right, it's mine. But maybe God has blessed me to be a blessing. So if any of you need cereal, Hook me up. You've got about two weeks till my children eat them all. Right? But what if God's given you now so you can be a blessing to someone else so you can, and then build your faith in the future that when you need it, He will provide? 
But maybe we're living in such a way we're negating the need for faith. Maybe we're living in such a way we're negating the need for faith. It is a faith exercise, blessed to be a blessing. Another reason we tend uh, to give away or, or another reason we don't tend to give away or throw away is because of sentiment. I've spoken about this, right? And, and, and again, we can be thankful for, for what those objects allowed to take place in our lives or to celebrate or to enjoy, but we can remember them. God's given us memories. He's given us life. He's given us joy. And that's where we remember and we can be thankful, but we do not need to be defined or owned by them. How many times have you moved with boxes and boxes of sentimental stuff that may never be opened, may never be used, and may never be looked at again? Right, it's just gathering dust. It's just taking up, accumulating more space. It's making more work for others when we pass. At the end of the day, we're all going to pass. And all we're doing is creating more burdens for other people because of our stuff. The second thing we need to do, uh, we're wanting to find freedom, is buy less stuff. Buy less stuff. Right, this should have been a message before Black Friday. It would have saved us all a, a lot of unnecessary spending. But a statistic I read said 62% of people buy stuff to feel better about themselves, about life. 62% of us listening this morning confess to looking to the world to find comfort, to, find, to, to uplift our spirits at, rather than the Word of God. The other 48% probably, or 38% probably find it in something else. Right, we feel down or depressed or life is not working out like we hoped for, so we look online for the deals, for shopping, for whatever it is, right? Whether we're buying eight boxes of cereal or we're um, buying clothes or looking for new stuff, we're always looking for the next thing that will bring us satisfaction rather than being found in Christ and Christ alone. Because it never satisfies, at least not for very long. And we combat a worldly desire through prayer, fixing our eyes on Jesus, and through meditation on the Word. Because I've said it, we're not going to just change overnight. <coughs> Sorry, we're not just going to change overnight. We're not just going to change overnight. We know that. And the only way to combat the desires of this world is to replace those things. Paul says, don't kick the ball outside. He says, or don't kick the ball inside. Go kick it outside. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. But in prayer and supplication, surrender to the Lord. So Lord, the, this morning, help us to stop fixating our eyes on whatever deals come out. Let us fix our eyes on your word. Let us fix our eyes on the practices that produce patience. Through fixing eyes on Jesus, through meditation of the Word. Psalm says this, Psalms 119, 36. Give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. How many of you are praying that this morning? That's my prayer for us as a church. Give me an eagerness for your laws rather than a love for money. Lord, I love your, your laws, but I also love money. And money is not evil in and of itself. It's a love of money that produces problems. It's a love of money that causes us to compromise in our ethics, in our business practices, in our tithing, in every aspect that God has called us to be faithful and honest with. It's a love of money that breeds deceit. And the psalmist is declaring, Lord, help me to fixate on your laws and your guidance and your ways over and above a love for money. Help me to stay pure rather than be caught up in turmoil. goes on, turn my eyes from worthless things. Turn my eyes from online shopping, from Gumtree, from all these things that I do not need time wasted, hours and hours wasted looking for something to make us feel better. Turn my eyes from the worthless things and give my life through your word. So measure of a life is not found in stuff, as Jesus has told us this morning. It's found in the presence of God, in a connection with God. And it says, turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. That life is found, a connection to God is found through the word of God. Imagine you spent as much time in the word as you did looking online shopping. Or going to the mall and walking around. And lastly, give more. Church, we need to be generous. I'm not talking about giving to the church, although I believe the Bible's clear about that, that we should give. God loves a cheerful giver. It enables kingdom growth, kingdom advancement. It keeps the lights on. 
But give more. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 is rough. It's rough. It says, teach those who are rich in this world. And that's all of us, right? That when the Bible speaks about rich, it's speaking about you and me. You're listening online with data or with Wi-Fi, with whatever device. You are the rich the Bible speaks about. So it says, okay, teach us, right? It doesn't say, and I'll have teach again. It's something we're teaching. It's something we're practicing. We're practicing practical practices for for patience and peace. We're practicing continuously. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. Don't trust in your money. It's a false God. It's a false security, which is so unreliable. (coughs) It took some of us a pandemic to realize the truth of that statement. Do not trust in money. It's unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So the richness of God, the goodness of life, and life and life to the fullest is found in God. Tell them to use their money to do good. Use your money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. So church, as we just navigate our our lives, as we navigate our stuff, as we navigate just Christmas season, may you throw out, may you buy less, and may you give more. And in doing so, we would ultimately follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Ultimately, love like Jesus, those around us, we wouldn't be distracted uh, and we could reconcile and reconnect with God. Because we have so much more time, not distracted by, by the weight of this world, but that we would be lifted and find freedom in who God is. Are you accumulating on earth what you cannot keep? Or are you investing in heaven what you cannot lose? Let's pray, and then after that we'll go into the time of worship. Yes, Lord, we just thank you for your goodness in our lives. Thank you, Lord, you kept my voice going for today's recording. We thank you that everything we do have is from above. The Father of lights, there's no variation or change. Lord, so we say thank you, Lord. We don't take for granted your goodness in our lives, that you have blessed us so richly, Lord. But we know that with that comes the responsibility, Lord. And for many of us, we just want to repent this morning for finding our identity in the things that we own, finding our security in the things that we own, finding our our purpose or whatever it is, Lord, in the things that we fill our homes with, Lord. So, Lord, we, we repent this morning. We say, sorry, Lord, that we have replaced you with idols, Lord. The Bible speaks about that as idolatry. We have replaced the one true living God with created objects, and have sought them for satisfaction and, and, and enjoyment, where Scripture says it is only found in you and you alone, or at least for eternal enjoyment, Lord. So, Lord, just as we navigate this Christmas season, Lord, that you would bring true freedom. You would wrestle in our hearts now, Lord. We know that we all have stuff we can throw out, we can sell, we can give away, we can buy less, Lord. So as we navigate these waters, Lord, we pray that you would guide and direct us, Lord. We pray for opportunity. Lord, if we, we believe that you've blessed us to be a blessing. You've given us abundance so that can overflow to those around us. Lord, that you would lead people across our paths. You would place names on our hearts and possessions that we own in which you want us to be a blessing to others, Lord. So we pray that now in your wonderful name, your mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you did not hold on to equality with God, but emptied yourself to become a servant all the way to the cross. So we say thank you, Jesus, in your wonderful mighty name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's worship now, church. Good morning, family of God. We are back with you this morning, and we just want to worship God. Please, um, there where you are in your, uh, in your living room or in your bedroom, While you're watching, if you want to lift up your hands, do it. Um, We just want to praise God this morning.
Thank you very much. Have a wonderful week.